I'd like to welcome everybody to chime in at the Changes Me International. This is the first of our media training calls and sessions. I'm Kelly Sullivan Walden. I am one of the core team members. I'm director and um, co-founder of Chime In, and I'm really excited to be with you today. And I have with me also presenting is Susan Johnson. She is our director of operations and also also, Benjamin Suarez, who's our director of, I don't know if we have an exact perfect title for you, Benjamin, director of all things artistic and creative and spiritual. <laughs> so we'll come up with a, a more concise title, title later. So this is, this is the first of these sessions. And one of the reasons why Susan Johnson and I decided that we wanted to lead these and present these was so that our youth ambassadors could feel prepared when the media comes to call. We find that it's, it's special when you get young people involved in a program that usually is something that only older people are a part of, something that, you know, when you think of changing the world, most people think about the adults of the world that have a lot of wisdom, a lot of experience under their belt that they're the ones that are making the changes and it's still kind of a radical concept that young people are the change young people are really the movers and shakers and by young i don't just mean like um you know teenagers i mean this is young adults this is also the young person within us all our belief is that the changes that are necessary in the world are going to come from that place of of innocence of excitement of passion even a little bit of rebellion, wildness. And those are all qualities that we would mostly ascribe to young people. And because of all of that, we, we want our youth ambassadors and our youth community to get in front of the media as often as possible. Because the more we do that, the more we can spread the word, the more we can have the peace projects that, that each of us are involved in and each one of our youth ambassadors are involved and we can, we can get traction and have more people be involved. But that also means there's a lack of experience because you're young. That means that there's a lack of experience in terms of being in front of media, radio, television, magazines. So there's, there's a few things that we want to make sure that you feel really comfortable with and prepared for so that you make the best impression and that you have the best experience, mostly from my perspective. The idea is to, in some ways, get yourself out of the way so you're not so concerned about what you're saying and making sure that it's perfect and right so that you can feel confident enough, you can get yourself out of the way so that the message comes roaring through, so that the message speaks louder than words. So Susan and I are going to start this session tonight because we've had a lot of experience and Benjamin is also going to join us because he's had lots of experience on camera as well. We're going to talk about what it's like from our perspective um, next week. In the weeks that follow, we're going to have Steve Allen from Steve Allen Media talk about from a publicity perspective what he wants to see our youth ambassadors know and feel confident in so that they can make the best impression possible. Nancy Telfero is going to share about being in public, whether it be public speaking or leading a workshop. And, um, and then we also have Ambassador Mildred Espinosa from Guatemala. She's the Guatemalan tourist, ambas ambassador of tourism. And she'll talk some about the protocol of being a UN ambassador, as well as being a host on a major news channel. She was the host on a Telemundo news channel, and she's done documentaries. So being on both sides of the camera as a host and a guest. So what am I missing, Susan? What, what else is... Are we doing? I don't, I don't think anything. I think that's just great. All right. So um, let's get started then. I'm going to tell you a little bit about Susan Johnson. So you, if you're listening to this for the first time and you're not familiar with some of the, the people that we're going to be interviewing, I'm going to um, just give you a little bit of their bio and then interview them about what it's like for them to be on media and some of their pointers. So first I'll start with Susan. So Susan is our Chime In co-founder and director of operations. Susan's passion for health, wellness, and family are the pillars that uphold her adventurous 
life. Her degree in interpersonal communication and small group development from Emerson College served her well as she performed duties as COO, CFO, and lead trainer for Healthy Inspirations, an international chain of women's weight loss centers. As a manager also in the hotel industry and the lead fundraiser for Roger Williams Park Zoo. Today, you'll find her leveraging her extensive experience and passion in her successful essential oil business. And she is a gold person, by the way. Speaking, coaching internationally, and orchestrating the inner workings of Chime In as one of the co-founders and director of operations. As active as she is, she always finds time for her family of four, five if you count the dog, Stella. And a kind word to a passing stranger on the street. She's a buoyant optimist and yet incredibly grounded. In fact, you'll often hear whispered behind her back, how does she do it? I want to be like Susan Johnson when I grow up. Or what would Susan Johnson do in this situation? So if you're looking for a mentor, that <laughs> how to combine work and fun, look no further. Oh, and did I mention she also owns her own island off the coast of Rhode Island? So um, you want to, you really want to get to know this woman. She is amazing. Susan Johnson, welcome to our very first media training. <laughs> well, thank you, Kelly Sullivan Walden. I, I don't know who that is, but boy, here I am. <laughs> <laughs> I know her. I could get you a meeting with her. She's me. Sold, sold, sold. <laughs> and one thing that I, I really love, I love Susan, and I just, you know, I just have to make this a little personal. We've, we spent all last year and months leading up to last year, and it was a true hero's journey. And often, in the honeymoon stage of an idea or a project, everyone is wonderful and you know everyone's on their best behavior and then the program sets in and then you kind of get to see some of the behind the scenes and some of the quirks and some of the skeletons that haven't quite been worked out. I didn't find any of those with you. I found you to be just as wonderful when things are smooth as when they are difficult. I found that you are incredibly grounded and, and peace under fire and I just feel so blessed to have you on our team in, in the core of Chime In. And I really, really appreciate you. Well, thank you very much. It's a pleasure to be with you. And I feel the same about each one of our co-founders and mentors and, and directors and, and all that. So it's a fabulous thing. Great. So let's just jump right into it. So from your experience, I know last year, I don't know, I don't know if you counted how many interviews you did. I'm sure it was probably near, if not 50, maybe 100, maybe, maybe more, um, ra radio, television, magazine, internet. Probably close to 50. Okay. So that's a lot. That's a lot. Yep. So you and have, before then, I had done radio and had hosted a radio show, and so I've had other. Right. So you've been in the in the press, and your whole family was in the press. You were all in the in the long in the Rhode Island newspaper. So Caitlin, <laughs> Susan's daughter. Hello, Caitlin, who's now hello. on our program in in many ways as a, as part of our youth community, and and we'll find out more as we go along. But so great to have you with us, Caitlin, and the whole Johnson family was in the newspaper. So let's just talk about. Let's start before you get on camera, before an interview. When you know you're going to do an interview, what are some things that you do to prepare yourself so that you feel confident and comfortable? So first and foremost for me is to make sure I have my talking points. I like to have the questions that I know will be answered or, or be asked of me and that I'll need to answer. I like to have them in the car with me. I like to wake up in the morning, go to bed at night, just kind of reading the questions and then kind of talking through them. You never get them every right, and they're always asked a little differently, but when you've practiced enough where it makes sense, if they kind of throw a curveball at you, you can always come back to the center. So, so having some, some good stats, um, some, a good little elevator speech about the organization that you work for, um, and what you're trying to accomplish, I think is really key. Um, the second thing I think is really important is that you don't have anything major going on before you get on. When you first start, you need to have that 15 minutes beforehand to know you're there, that the phone works or that the computer works, um, you know, that you've dialed in and that you can kind of sit there in your own space. 
you get more and more advanced in it, it doesn't become quite as difficult. But when you first do it, your last thing you want to do is come on with anxiety. You want to make sure that you're grounded before you get on. Because if you're already anxious, you'll talk faster. You'll, you, just, you don't seem to catch your pace. And the interview's over sometimes because sometimes they're 10 minutes, sometimes they're 15, sometimes they're an hour. But, but in those ones that you're really rushed, they always seem to be the short ones. And by the time you're off, it's just when you're kind of getting into your into your, your, uh, you know, your pattern, your, your, your flow. Mm, that's wonderful. I notice what you're wearing. So let's go with, with what you wear, because sometimes you're interviewed for a TV show and it could be via satellite. Um, it, it could also be in, in person. So I like the color that you're wearing. I think yep. you're dressed appropriately. Let's talk about, let's talk about that. Yep. So very important to me. Um, I like something that comes a little higher collared. Um, I'm, I'm not one to have a, a, a low collar, a, a low V. Some people look great on. For me, I have a very long neck, and I have to always keep that in mind because if I get on camera, I can look off portion, uh, off portion. Mm -hmm. um, I think that picking a color that works with your skin tone is really important. And for me, I'm not a makeup girl, so I don't wear makeup when I'm on camera yet in general. Um, I did when I was on with um, Fox Television. They actually made me up. And it was really interesting because there was very mixed reaction to my makeup. Uh, some people were like, wow, that looks really great. And other people were like, it doesn't look like you. <laughs> so know beforehand who you are and understand that if you go on like I do with no makeup, that it often shows everything. You know, sometimes that makeup is better. You have to learn. And, and so when I do go on camera, I will often wear um, just a little bit of mascara and a little bit of something to stop the shine. But I'm very careful, and, and, and I only wear a very light lipstick because for me, when people look at me and they know me, they go, whoa, you know, I, I'm much more natural. So you need to figure out what your look is for camera because the last thing you want to do is be playing with a bunch of makeup before you go on and realize you look like a clown or it right. didn't come off right or you don't like it afterwards. Right. I'll just add to that, that often the way that you look on camera is very different than in real life because the, can the, the lights can wash you out. So if you don't have some kind of color on your cheeks or something, then you'll, you can look like a ghost. You can look really pasty. So, um, there is a different technique. And for, for women, mostly men don't have to worry about this so much. It's, it's not fair, actually. <laughs> but, but, you know, some, a lot of men sometimes do, do do some kind of makeup. But really, the idea isn't so much to make yourself up. It's mostly so as to not distract from your message. Because if there's, you know, a certain blotch or a certain something, and people can't really see your eyes, then it takes away. It's all about the message the message getting across. So you want the way you present yourself to not distract from that too much. And I like that you're, you're wearing a solid color. I'm just going to kind of go back and forth with you on this. Mm -hmm. um, you and I both picked a solid, bright color, and usually that plays best. So I'm wearing green. Sometimes on television, you want if you're going to wear green, it's a little risky because sometimes they'll have a green screen behind you and you'll look like a floating head. So... <laughs> A friend of mine just wore green on Fox News and it worked out because they didn't use a green screen and the green looked beautiful on her. And I told her, you, you know, you brought something as a backup just in case, right? So you can do that. If you really have a green outfit that you love, just bring something else as an option. Solid colors are best. Plaids, polka dots, anything with a pattern can get, it can actually move and look wavy. So I love this color on you, Susan. It's, it is natural. It does look like you and it's, it's, it's very friendly for the camera. Okay. Um, I'm kind of, I'm wanting to talk to Benjamin too, but I think I'll bring him in afterwards. I, I'm, I'm kind of, if, if you have anything that you want to share that you're like burning to share, Benjamin, then, then chime in. Otherwise I'll get to you when we get to you. <laughs> okay, great. All right. So let's, let's imagine now that you are at the beginning of the interview. And, and the interview is underway. So what are some things that you do to, to stay centered, connected with the host? Tell me some of the, the process, some of the things that you think that would be important for the, the youth ambassadors to keep in mind when they're being interviewed. So, I, so first and foremost, I think that you need to set yourself in the chair that you're in before you get on camera, before they roll, play with the, your legs, you know, 
how much is being shown? What type of address do you have on? Do you cross your leg? Is it comfortable? Because the last thing you want to be doing is shifting all over your interview. You want to make sure that you are, you're present. I like to have my hands positioned. I like to know where my hands are going to be. Although I do use my hands, I always bring them back to a, a, a comfortable place on my lap. I think that's important. Um, I think you want to make sure that you've, you've had something in your mouth so that your mouth is not dry. Right. You know, you don't want a dry mouth. There's nothing worse than having a dry mouth. So having a sip of water before you step on stage. And just so you know, when you do, my experience has always been that they get you out there and then they kind of play with cameras and things and then it goes. So you do usually have that little bit of time if you're doing an, a formal interview type of thing where you can sit there. I think it's also important to figure out where your host is so that you can move your body toward them, yet you're still looking at the camera. And if they're a good organization, if it's, it's someone that does this all the time, they'll actually work with you. They'll set the cameras for you. But, you know, it might be the local media. You might be standing somewhere. You know, they might be coming to you at, at you're hosting something. So you have to think about where you are um, when, you, when you talk about that. Mm, that that brings up an interesting point. I know most of the time when I've done an on camera shoot, they they they've told me, okay, here's your camera because there's many cameras. This is the one that's on you. So if you're going to look out, look in this camera. Otherwise, just look at the host that's and right. don't be because sometimes it looks like you're just you know kind of you might think that you're looking in the right camera, but you're you're not. So if when in doubt, just look at the host and just have a a one-on-one -on -one conversation with the host. You can indicate out, but sometimes it doesn't play well. So you need to yeah. kind of know. I know um, when I did Dr. Oz, they were very, very specific. Only look at this host, and then if you're going to look, only move your head this much and look here. But often they will tell you where to look. But when in doubt, just pay attention to the host. It's a good thing. Yep. Okay, so... What about things that you do? Have, have you ever gotten nervous? And if so, what do you do to counterbalance that so that you can come back to a centered place? Yeah, so absolutely. And I think when you first start out, I, you know, I go back to uh, when I was at the Roger Williams Park Zoo, I had to present every year on a local television station. I had to talk about the event. We did cooking with a local chef and things like that. And I, I remember those first few times were a little nerve-wracking. You know, again, you, you can feel yourself nervous. So, again, getting there early, making sure you haven't had four cups of coffee before you appear, you know, mm -hmm. making sure that you've got, you know, you're, you're, you're ready to go. Um, and then, you know, always remember that it's only a certain number of minutes and you'll be okay in the long run. Take a deep breath. Um, I think that one of the most important things is to realize is that sometimes when the host is talking, you can't forget that you're still on camera, that the cameras don't come off you even though the host is talking. They might in their editing do that if they are going to edit, but mm -hmm. for the most part, you don't know when the camera's off you. So to, to take that, and there's nothing wrong with taking that deep breath when they're talking and, and kind of ground yourself. For me, the first few that I did, I find I get more nervous as the interview goes on. Oh. For me, I have very mindful at the end, not at the beginning, which is very odd. Not anymore, but, but when I first few times I did, I found I got more nervous and had to mentally tell myself to slow down at the end of the interview. That's interesting. That's interesting. Um, I know for myself, I, blood sugar is really important. I, I, can, I have been in the past hypoglycemic. And I know that because I, I do drink coffee, so I just have to drink. If I'm going to drink coffee before an interview, it's, it's small sips, not like a big gulp, 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 gulp. It has to just be very small. And I have to have eaten something before. So I'm the queen of carrying around. I carry around a kind bar. If there's nuts in it, it's, and I mean, there's probably something that's more um, protein, but I also carry raw almonds with me everywhere. And I can tell when somebody starts to get lightheaded. I can tell when I start to. And that is like, it's dangerous to be doing an interview and let your head get light. So right before, a few minutes before, eat those raw almonds. And then also, I am the queen of throat coat tea. It's, I get it from Whole Foods. And it's, I mean, I now love it. I used to just drink it before interviews. And now I'm not drinking it right now because... I forgot to do it, but um, almost all the time I drink it, it helps to make the throat just feel a lot more coated. 
and soft. And like Susan said, to make sure that you have, that you've had a little something to drink, not alcohol to drink, something to wet your palate. So some people bring a cough drop with them so that their, their throat's nice and smooth. Cause sometimes if you do get a little nervous, you get dry mouth and there's nothing worse under the sun. Than someone talking who has dry mouth. Ooh, even if you've got the most important message in the world, no one's going to be hearing it if your mouth is all cottony. So I all, I'm almost always, I will make sure that there's water on the set with me. So if I need to grab a sip, so what? I'm going to drink. Dana's like, well, you drink too much. I'm like, I'm Irish. It comes with the territory. I don't care. So I'd rather, I'd rather be drinking a little something and talking and feel smooth than to have dry mouth. There's nothing worse than that. Okay. And, and as far as the nervousness for me, and then um, I think I want to segue and bring Benjamin in because I can feel that he's got some really great things to share here. For me, I'm a hypnotherapist by trade and I learned because I used to, I used to get really nervous in front of people. I'm, I'm an extrovert. There were times in the past when it was absolutely terrifying to me. So being a hypnotherapist was really helpful. And one of the things that I do at very gently to myself is I, I count myself down from 10 to zero and 10, I kind of imagine it's like a staircase. And I do this a few minutes before sometimes I'm doing it while I'm brushing my teeth and even thinking, I just ground myself. I start at 10 and I count myself down. Zero represents ah, this deep place of feeling rooted and grounded and almost, this is my little sneaky thing, almost even sleepy so mellow that it's like, okay, it's just I'm talking to an ordinary person. It's an ordinary day. It's just a person. We're sitting down. We're talking. So what? I'd rather be a little bit mellow. And I might not seem that way ever. People always think I'm spastic. But inside, there is a place of mellowness. And I deliberately, I even make my shoulders drop. I breathe into my belly. And I literally make myself, I imagine sometimes that I'm even in a bathtub with, with bubble bath and I'm feeling that relaxed, like that deep ease, not just ordinary ease, but deep ease. Because once everything takes off, sometimes it can take off and I get really excited. I get, I get really animated and I want to start from a grounded place. So, and the other thing I do, and the last thing, this is the last thing I'll say before I bring out Benjamin. I'm, it helps me if I'm really connected to the why. Why am I doing the interview? What's the purpose? If, if it's just about me being cute, then it's going to suck. It's going to be bad. Because then the focus is on me and then I'm self-conscious. But if I'm focusing on you, if I'm focusing on what I want to contribute from my heart to your heart, then there's this flow that happens. So I notice I get less... If I if I start feeling nervous, that means I'm thinking about myself. So then the quick way to flip that is to think about who I want this message to reach and why it's important. And then I then I relax and I'm I'm often way better when I'm thinking about the purpose of, of why I'm doing this and who I want to hear this and the, the difference that it could make in their life. So let me introduce you to Benjamin. I want to bring him out and give him a proper introduction because Benjamin is quite amazing. Let me just pull him up for a second. So Benjamin, um, oh, I thought you were right there. Easy. Uh, here we go. I'm just ad-libbing a little bit here. I need a little music. Dun, 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 dun. Okay, Benjamin. <laughs> that, like game show music. All right, so Benjamin, I don't know that there's really a bio on the planet that would aptly describe Benjamin Suarez. He is both a student and a teacher of life. He's traveled and worked in over 50 countries, and the number's probably more than that at this point. After living his childhood dream of playing professional soccer in Europe, Mr. Suarez shifted his focus toward the healing arts. He's, a recognized, he's recognized internationally for his incredible paintings and his art therapy projects with the children of war in Central Africa, with recently freed slaves, slaves of India and orphans from the guerrilla warfare in Colombia. He's lived and studied with indigenous tribes in the Amazon for years and exhibits his work in museums and galleries on four continents. 
that we know of so far. Together with Luke and the Lovingtons, he co-founded the Goodness Tour, taking music and art where it cannot be paid for, live concerts with paint for people facing adversity. So Benjamin has been a vital part of Chime In. He is, a, he always brings in such spirit and such it's like his, he is the most interesting man in the world. He has, he's got the best stories and they're all authentic. His tattoos tell a story. His paintings tell the most incredible stories. So there's so much heart and soul where Benjamin's concerned. And our organization is blooming as a result of you being a part of it. And I, we all love you, Benjamin. Thank you for joining us in China and today on this media call. Well, thank you. Thank you so much. It's, uh, you know, when, when I receive um, such beautiful words, I know not only is that a reflection of the people that are speaking the words, uh, but also it's a, it's a beautiful confirmation, you know, from uh, our surroundings and to breathe it in and to really soak it up and I have a moment where I blink and when I take a breath in, I feel that and I let that go to different dark corners inside of myself to really lighten up all of me. And because the lighter I feel, the lighter on my feet I feel, the more we're ready to act in the moment, in the now, and really direct you know, the overall message and the main purpose of why we're here and what I love so much about the way that Susan responded to you, such incredible compliments for which she deserves every one of them was that she didn't divert them to somebody else. She first said, thank you. And then she said, what I would love to say is that really we're reflections of each other. And there's so many people on our team that are glowing and shining with so many talents and skills that it helps all of us feel even more powerful in the way that we stand together hand in hand. And so, you know, it takes a, a group to really make this kind of movement happen that we're doing. And uh, I'm just really honored to be here also. Thank you, Benjamin. So from a media perspective, you've been in front of the camera many, many times. And excuse the lovely sound. Susan, I'm going to let you ask these questions. Um, I'm going to just start with, what do you do to prepare yourself for being on camera? Well, I, I really like to root myself. So I'll usually take like a five minute walk and I will do kind of what Susan was talking about, about having like all of the possibilities, all of the uh, questions that that are going to come and, and kind of mull them over for a second. And I like to do something with my pen because I, I like to uh, learn and be very visual. And so I draw with a pen and oftentimes I'll close my eyes and I'll scribble something and I'll open my eyes and see how fast my imagination can create a picture, create an image out of scribbles. And I think of that a lot and kind of giggle when a question might kind of come out of left field. And, you know, it wasn't a question that was, uh, was, was on my mind before I went into the interview because I love how those bring out elements that we might not have been able to prepare for, but the spontaneity of it is so much more pure and connected uh, when I get those questions. So I love being able to take any question, any line with a pen that you can't erase, you can't erase a question after it's been asked on camera and allow that to evolve and sculpt it and take that interview exactly where you want it to go because you're not uh, going along for the ride. They're asking you questions for a reason. So like you were saying, Kelly, what is the main intention and the purpose like so much larger than just one of us and when we're tapped into that message, then nothing can rock us from uh, conveying it because it, it's so much larger than the little insecurities that try and creep in each one of us, you know? Mm. That's great. That's great. So I would ask you this, Benjamin. So, so for you, many times your interviews come when you're in the middle of painting. You've been in the middle of a project. 
you know, you've got paint on your hands, you've got paint on your face, you, you know, you're not, you're not wearing your, your tuxedo, which I don't even think you probably have one, at least not the traditional kind. So, not yet. You know, you know, like, our youth ambassadors might face that situation where they're on the spot. We might be building somewhere and someone steps in front of them and they've got paint on their face and their hair isn't right. You know, what, what would you say to people when they know that they're kind of caught in a spot where they're maybe not dressed like they would be if they could be, what's your quick to do when you get put on the camera really quickly? Well, the first thing, and I've trained myself to think this, so it happens very fast now, but it, you know, it took practice, is that in every moment, I'm exactly where I want to be, surrounding exactly what I want to be around because I've chosen to be there. If I wanted to be wearing something different, if I wanted to be somewhere else, then I would be. And really taking responsibility of those choices and owning it means that in every moment, we're, com we're comfortable in our skin, whatever we're wearing. And that feeling inside for me is really, really important because when I'm talking to uh, a president of an association or of a country in Latin America, or I'm talking to somebody that lives on the streets, each person is equally as important to speak with, with heart and soul and, and be in the moment with them and listen the best that we possibly can. So whether they have a camera or don't have a camera, mm -hmm. in every single moment, I kind of think that there's this audience that's hanging out in the clouds and watching us in every moment, in every breath that we take. And how are we, how are we interacting? And if we're looking at ourselves or we're watching our own movie or a loved one is you know, reflecting on our choices in our lives, well, how, how do we feel about that? Do we feel authentic in that moment and in the choices we make on and off camera? Because as we live more and more authentic in every moment off camera, then on camera is going to be the exact same and it doesn't make any difference. All right, great. I love it. So, you know, I'll, I'll put, pose the same question that Kelly posed to me now. How many interviews do you think you've done to give people an idea of, of the scope of how long you've been doing this? Well, uh, <laughs> let's see. Um, you know, it's a, it's a good question. Uh, a lot. I think, I've, you know, in the last years, I've given a lot more in Spanish than in English. Uh, through, you know, so lots, you know, at least uh, 20 in Argentina and um, a good 20 in Venezuela and a lot in Colombia and um, yeah it's just it's been a real a real blessing to have the opportunity to channel this message and to hold space for so many incredible light workers and good-hearted people around the world that don't always get their voice heard mm -hmm. and that's why it's such an important thing that we take this responsibility serious and of course with a sense of humor as well uh, because there's so many people around the world that have such beautiful things that they're saying through their choices and actions that don't get heard that we get to be an ambassador truly and literally uh, of the people that that we want to hold space for that we want to shine a spotlight on and so I've heard for example award ceremonies where there's been a really amazing documentary and the directors and participants, you know, the, the people that ran the show and facilitated it got a lot, lot of, uh, a lot of recognition and they made sure that they listed every person that helped, you know, raise the money and make it all possible. And I thought, you know, that was really great. But I noticed the one thing that often is forgotten is that the kids that were in the documentary themselves that are showing the courage and stepping up and really giving us purpose to even show up and make a film like that, they weren't thanked. And I think that it's easy to forget, you know, when we're like in, in a moment where we, we need to say thank you to everybody. And I totally honor and respect that. I mean, by saying thank you to the art supply companies that have sponsored many of my projects, it's one of the reasons they keep 
sponsoring more and more projects and then being able to bring mm -hmm. thousands of more dollars mm -hmm. more mm -hmm. to the kids that I love to work with. And so for me, it's all, it's first and foremost, who are the, the, the underrepresented that are really stepping up that are, are, are being such courageous, beautiful souls that are redeeming my faith in humanity with every choice and beautiful smile that they bring after the things they've experienced. And remember that first and foremost, because that's why, that's why we're there. And then be able to really acknowledge all the people that helped get us there because we, we're not doing this alone. You know, we're never doing this alone. Even when I was eating out of the garbage can, I wasn't doing it alone because if people weren't throwing things away, then there wouldn't be any food to eat. I mean, in almost every scenario we can think of, there's different elements that are conspiring to help get us to where we are. Mm. And acknowledging that and, and giving everybody a sense of credit where credit is due and honoring the courage of each of the people that helped us get to where we're at, that, that in my opinion, makes everybody look that much bigger mm -hmm. opposed to, you know, not doing that. Mm. Terrific. Thank you. Thank so, you, Benjamin. So I'd, I'd ask you one more question. You know, you mentioned that you often take interviews in Spanish. If you were a youth ambassador and you have the ability to speak another language but are not necessarily fluent in it, how would you approach an interview knowing that the wrong thing said could be the wrong thing said? <laughs> <laughs> well, since the first thing when you're learning a language is usually profanity, I make sure that those words are not in my vocabulary whatsoever when I, when I enter. And I say, well, that, those aren't options, you know. <laughs> first, and, first and foremost, I'm like, nope, that. Uh, uh, I know that a lot of people always like to take a foreigner and teach them a bad word because it's funny when they say it and they don't know what they're saying and there's an accent and all that. Um, that that's obvious, right? So for me, speaking in another language, uh, I focus on the elements most important. And I also understand that the people that are listening hear my accent and know that I'm not a native speaker and therefore they will forgive a grammar um, flaw more than saying a word that um, is disrespectful mm -hmm. or uh, ne neglectful um, or just way too over the top egocentric. Mm -hmm. uh, so then I, I, I really pick the words that best suit what it is that I want to share. And I reiterate that. And those, those, those words that carry like the essence of what the message is. Like when I talk in Spanish, um, let's say I'm, I'm working with the disability uh, down in uh, Argentina, in Mendoza, Argentina. And they, you know, catch me in the middle of painting a mural or, uh, or working in these, uh, these schools. Well, Alma, just soul, you know, uh, courage, the courage of these kids. And, and, and pick like a, an adjective that describes what we admire about the people that we're working with. And the noun, you know, choose just the, the words that best describe in the most direct way with, without beating around the bush. And actually, I like giving interviews in another language more because it's a lot more direct because you have less words to choose from. So you just say exactly to the point, like an arrow shooting through the wind, what it is that you want to say. And you acknowledge that you had permission to make mistakes speaking because you're doing your very best to honor the place that you're at and the people you're speaking with by speaking their language. And people really love that even if you don't speak perfectly. Mm. Great. Thank you, Benjamin. Wow. Well, I, um, I want to, there's a, there's a whole bunch of, you know, little, little things that we can talk about and big things. And I want to make sure that we have room for, for questions. So um, let's see, is there, why don't we start with some questions and then, um, and then we can kind of touch on some of the other things. Is there, is this percolating any questions from, 
from any of our youth that are listening. Yeah. Yeah, Priyanka. I am a patient. Sure. Uh, so I have to head out in a minute, but I really want to ask this. Um, so how do you get these opportunities to go on camera? How do you get those press releases or um, radio talk shows, things like that? How do you get those opportunities? I'll take a stab at that answer, and then you guys can um, chime in as well. I love saying chime in. Um, one of them is is each of you, once your project is, is really defined as yours is, Priyanka, and you've got a great press angle, you can write your own first draft of a press release, and then we've got our own publicity team that, that is working with us. So as just in the kind of way that we've begun, I, I gave you the assignment to write your version of a press release, which you did instantly, which was beautiful. We send that over to Steve Allen and Mara, and then the ball's in their court to polish that, and, and then um, to send it back to you to make sure it still reflects the integrity of what your message is. And then they have media contacts. And you might also, as you go along, start developing some media contacts. I find that the media is interested in things like what we're doing. And once we get the ball rolling, they start coming out of the woodwork. And they might be interested in you, A, because of your project, B, because of where you're from, C, because you speak the right language or you speak the right multiple language or you're in the right place at the right time or it, you know, something that you said in a previous interview might have gotten heard by somebody and, and the, the ball starts rolling from there. And part of it is social media as well. Social media is always being looked at by, by larger media that's looking for interesting stories, interesting people, um, things that are inspirational and real. And you've got a great angle. It's, and that we could, I think when we have our week with Steve Allen, we'll talk a bit more about the art of a press release, really making the press release interesting, not just, hi, my name is so-and-so and I'm doing this cool project, but kind of why and how it juxtaposes to what's going on in society. I mean, I'm just going to say something about what, what I think is really exciting about Priyanka's project is she, she raised a, a few thousand dollars. And with that, went to Haiti, bought the, the mosquito nets, and, ha and made such a huge impact with a few thousand dollars versus the hundreds of millions of dollars that was raised for Haiti that went nowhere, that has literally gone down the drain. And so we could say, you know, yeah, that sounds like a really negative thing, but we always want to end it on a positive note. The positive note is make sure you do your giving to people who you know are going to actually go in country. They're going to be there. You can trust people like Priyanka. So it's not a sales pitch for you, although it kind of is. And maybe you can list other, other sources that are similar to that. So it is a message for people. And this is a hot topic. People want to give and yet they don't want their money to go down the drain. They want to know that their money is making impact. And you are one of those wonderful sources that does that. So, I, that's, that's my response. Um, yeah, and I would, I would add in there, Priyanka, that, you know, in working with Steve Allen and we worked with the World Peace Caravan and then we worked here with Chime Min, you know, the thing that he said to me is, who are the media around your area? Yes. So for you, you need to look at the local free papers. You look, need to look at the local free magazines. You need to look at the Providence Journal. You need to look at Fox Television. You need to look at who the local anchors are and come up with some names and you can go on everyone's website and get the, who the person is that you send. And then Steve Allen will help us by actually sending your press release to them. So usually if, you, if you're alone, if you're someone who's doing this on your own, you can send those out. Or if you have a, a press uh, person, they would do that for you, but they're going to, but you finding out who those local people are and then your kind of, city people, your state people, and then surrounding New England area for you, or if you're in a bigger state, because we're in New England, it's very small, something like California, you would look to find some in your own area, and then maybe the next big city, and then go from there. Because what happens is, is that 
when you talk about television, you often get picked up by a, a small paper and then the next bigger fish picks it up and wants to then interview you. It's what often happens. Mm -hmm. So for you, knowing that you've written your press release, that they're working on the polish of it, having names and email addresses of people to send that to for Steve Allen and his media team is going to be very important as well as for yourself. Yeah, I think we can get, I think it would be really wise and maybe this is its own call or maybe this is what we talk about partly when we do Steve Allen is really all the, the art of the press release. Getting yeah. dialing even deeper into that. So thank you for that excellent question. Benjamin. Uh, yeah, I wanted to say two things. Uh, first, uh, everything that is being shared here feels really important and I'd like to add that when you continue to do amazing work like you're doing and to just continue to dream larger and larger and being able to facilitate those dreams, manifest those dreams, it will come. And that's what's amazing about what it is that we're doing is that more and more our world wants to see beautiful stories of hope and courage and, and, uh, and faith and love and by doing what you're doing, I, I, I've been in the jungle a lot. And without those fly nets, I've seriously, I've had over 200 bites in 20 minutes. And I've had dengue. And I got to say, this is so awesome that you're giving these fly nets. And anybody, anybody that has been in a position where they're being attacked by mosquitoes um, and there's malaria or whatever really understands the the benefit of having a, a mosquito net before even a mattress mm -hmm. like that's uh it's really really great i want to say thank you for doing that mm -hmm. and keep doing that because you attract the kind of people that give you these insights for example well for a long while i didn't really ever like write any press release or even document what i was doing because i really just was so excited just to do it just for the soul of doing it in the heart of it and then yet thankfully it attracted people like susan like dana like kelly like steve that really have have a lot of experience in this area and so maintaining the soul of why you do what you do throughout it all the media is going to show up in a big way and when it does, you're not going to doubt yourself to always be authentic when you're expressing what you're here to do on this planet and what your purpose is that you've chosen. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Excellent. All right. Now I know Priyanka has to go, right, Priyanka? Yes. Okay. Priyanka, thank you. That's okay. Thank you, Priyanka. Thank you, Priyanka. You look so beautiful. You dressed for the occasion. I appreciate it. And it's a good background that you have. It looks really good. <laughs> okay. Thank you. On your on the other calls that you if you can and if you can't we know you'll be there with us in spirit. Thank you. Absolutely. Thank you. Have a good night. All right. Bye, Priyanka. Bye, Priyanka. Um, Ciao. Um, there's a there's a couple things I just want to add. I think one thing is when when it comes to doing media, I think the people that are watching there there's Susan and I learned about this. We did a workshop together about the different ways that the brain works. There's the people that are really analytical. There's the people that want marching orders, that want to know what they can do. There's some people that want to, they really want to know the people's story, the, the like who the person is and why they're doing what they're doing. They want to know the backstory. And some people just want to be inspired. So if you can, if you can speak in a way that touches on all of those four things in a way you'll be bringing as many people in as possible like susan said having the sound bites together that might include some statistics and and some of the the things that would be relevant but don't leave the people part out i to me i err on the side of wanting people to be inspired so that to me i, I feel like when i'm listening to something i want to feel something i want to be moved more than i want absolutely every scientific fact Although it's always great when there can be some kind of grounded scientific fact along with inspiration. So think about, you know, letting people feel your passion and your excitement about what you're doing. Um, okay, so I think let's, there's a few things. I'm just going to talk about the timing and then have you guys talk about this as well. Sometimes in an interview, They'll tell you, I, I, from a host perspective, because I host a radio show, I always have time on my brain as a host. When I'm a guest, I don't think about it as much because I feel like I'm a little bit more passive. 
I'm in the hands of the host. But it, as a host, I love it when the guest is timely as well. Like they, they know, okay, we've got a two minute piece right now. So give me like a sound bite. But I also don't want them to speak in such short sentences that it's boring. I don't want one word answers out of my guests. So I want there to be some kind of juice. So um, Susan, Benjamin, can you speak to that about, about fitting your message inside the appropriate time? Because like actually right now we've got, in order to meet our, like for this to be an hour, we've got about seven minutes remaining. So say something about timing. Go ahead, Benjamin. Well, okay, I think what you said, and I feel what you said, both analytically and with feeling, is totally right on the dot. As far as tapping into the logistical elements and, and the statistics and the heart, and if you have two minutes, let's say you're taking a project and you say, so we had the, the blessing to be able to provide and to hold space for over 800 child soldiers and recently free sex slaves to express themselves and have a positive outlet to channel out the trauma and really confront PTSD, post-traumatic stress in a positive way where they can bring a good influence back to their culture and to their community, their family, and to their hearts. And what courage that they show to step up and to face their deepest fears and their most uh, horrifying memories and nightmares and find their freedom. Here they are with us through their artwork to express mm -hmm. their freedom to all of us. And these are the voices that not everybody always gets to hear, but amazing courage. And they're sending it out everywhere. Check it out. And mm -hmm. so saying, you know, something about how many people you were working with, what the main purpose of doing it was, and what was the effect that was uh, psychologically uh, beneficial for mm -hmm. their lives, and why were we inspired by even being blessed to be there in their presence? What is mm -hmm. it that they did that overcame, you know, the, that for which tries to suppress or oppress humanity? That's great. That's excellent. Great example, Benjamin. Excellent. Susan? Yeah, and I think I think the the hardest thing when you first start interviewing is is getting told. You know, you, sometimes you can hear it in your ears. Sometimes someone flashes at you. You know, we've got two minutes left. It's being mindful about what you say to again not give that small answer, but not go into such great detail that you can't stop. So it is. It's not something that comes naturally. I think it's something that you have to practice. And I think that, again, having certain bites in your mind, little bite clips that you've practiced, gives you that opportunity. Because many times the host will say to you, you know, we're just about ready to go on break. Is there something that you'd like the audience to know? Mm -hmm. And then you can draw on one of those things very quickly. Now, most of, your, most of the times this is going to happen in a studio setting mm -hmm. or on a telephone setting. It's not going to happen when you're out in the public. They're going to edit what they want. So, so it is good to have those, just those little bits and pieces. Like Benjamin had that, that spot that was just about perfect. Mm -hmm. You know, you can see that he knows what he's talking about. He knows what he's saying. He says it with passion. He says it with conviction. And it's not, he knew when to stop. Right, right. I always suggest having a clock nearby for me. I can get lost in time. I can get lost in the subject matter. So if I don't have a clock visually somewhere off that I can see somewhere near my line of vision, then ooh, that could be dangerous. So I always have a clock. <laughs> <laughs> That's a good idea. Yeah, make sure to do that. And speaking of speaking of that kind of thing, in terms of in terms of technology, so so far, Benjamin's been outside and it's been visually so awesome. And it makes me think if you are in an environment that's beautiful and it has good solid Wi-Fi, then, you know, think about having a pretty background because that's if, if, if it's some kind of if, if this was the news that we were recording Benjamin, this would be such an inviting thing. To me, sometimes it's a little bit dangerous to be outside only because sometimes the Wi-Fi can waffle and sometimes there can be, you know, crazy noises that go by. But if it's not, if you've tested it and it's a nice environment, then, then, then wow, outdoors is always preferred. And yet, when push comes to shove, I've, there was one guy that I did an interview with and he was out and about and he was kind of walking around and it was, 
I was as the host. I was so annoyed. I was like, Dude, still just for the time we're doing the interview because it sounds horrible and you're having a fun time, but we can barely hear you. So it's hard to hear. And then there's a, a big radio show that I've been, um, I've had the blessing of being a guest on about a half dozen times and they, they have just recently changed, but they wouldn't interview anybody unless they had an, a landline with an actual wire to the wall. Yeah. They, they want the recording to be good quality for years to come. So whatever you can do to make sure that you have four bars or an actual landline or Skype. I'm using my, my I bought this fancy little recording this little microphone because it does make for a better sound recording when I, a lot of people are recording me these days via Skype and the sound does sound a lot better with this and it's like $200 Radio Shack. It's called the Blue Yeti or just a Yeti microphone. And you can get a little cam a little um, light so that, you know, things look better. Lights, camera, action, get some technology. If if it looks like you're starting to do enough interviews that, that it warrants that, it's, you know, pay attention to some of those things. Okay. Um, anything you want to say about that, Susan, Benjamin, anything else on that technology? Um, uh, yeah, I'm running for my power cord because it could die, and that would be a catastrophe <laughs> if you're in an interview and you're about to lose energy and you can't you can't say goodbye or uh, have a nice time for a conclusion. You know, right, right. That's true. That's ideal. Ideal. You want to ideally you want to make sure that you're fully charged and that you don't have other things ringing or buzzing in the background. Ideally, that's not always the case. And yet, if something happens. Have a sense of humor about it. Don't pretend it didn't happen. Just make the best out of it. People want to see the, you know, your humanity. They want to see you being professional, but also human. They expect you to be human. Um, got my cord. What happened? What's that? I, said, I got my cord. <laughs> Sorry. You got his cord. Yay. Cord's good. Cord's good. One, of the, one of the funny stories that, that you know, I can, we can kind of, I'll, I'll wrap my end of this up with is that, you know, I took many interviews here at, at, at my home. And we are using our technology, our cell phones. Well, I was on an interview. I was talking to New Zealand, and all of a sudden, they were gone. And I'm like, where'd they go? I, I don't know where they went. So I had to dial back into the show. What had happened is, is that someone had pulled into the driveway, and my phone paired with the car. So all of a sudden, the, the person is speaking to Caitlin, the announcer's and she's going, huh? What? <laughs> <laughs> Isn't that funny? So you have to be very mindful too because, you know, somebody pulls in and your, your car, it gets paired. You're gone. Oh. Yeah, I turned, I turned the car on and there was like someone talking to me. I was like, huh? <laughs> <laughs> okay. uh, for a couple of seconds, but I was like, <laughs> what was that? Why do you have such a funny accent? And who are you? And why are you bothering me? Oh. <laughs> yeah, exactly. so, you know, again, just some of the things that can happen, you know, if you're like us and you have cars with Bluetooths and different people drive, you have to be mindful that your Bluetooth doesn't pick up in the car and you're gone. Right. <laughs> it's always good to practice those things ahead of time. And sometimes you can't know until, until it happens. But speaking of, speaking of New Zealand, sometimes you'll be interviewed by another country and that means different time zones. So go out of your way, spend time to make sure you, you have the right time zone, that your time is right. I can't tell you how many times for myself in the past, way, way in the past, and people that I know that have completely missed their interview or come in late or come in frazzled because they didn't do the math right. Because sometimes with daylight savings, with the time change, you just have to double, triple, quadruple check to make sure that you've got that piece, that piece handled. So, how about as we're wrapping up here, one last, like, let's try doing one minute of final words from Susan, Benjamin, and myself. And Caitlin, do you have any questions? We didn't get to you. No, I'm more of a listener. Okay. We appreciate you. Thank you. Except when somebody's talking in your car when it's been paired incorrectly. <laughs> huh? <laughs> huh? So, so last, uh, a last tidbit of advice, some words of wisdom to leave our youth ambassadors with. Susan. So for me, I, I would tell you to relax. I would tell you to enjoy it. I would tell you to prepare as much as you can without stressing yourself out about it. 
and know that each time you do it, it gets easier. But, you know, good preparation, what am I going to wear, what am I going to say, how am I going to look, is my phone charged, do I have my cord, for those first few is very helpful. Again, as you do more, it gets easier. But being mindful in those first few, and then again, taking that time to meditate, taking that time to bring it down, I think is really important. They'd be my best words of wisdom. That's excellent. Thank you, Susan. Benjamin? Well, that, that was beautiful. That was beautiful. I say, uh, remember that you're absolutely worthy because you've been invited to do the interview. People want to hear what you have to say. And when you speak, know that you're providing information that makes the world a better place. And there's something so rewarding and it just lights you up inside that you can't go wrong. Uh, failure is not an option when you sit and you breathe and you know that the direction you're going is very authentic and very true and important for the development and evolution of humanity. So what we're doing is solid, beautiful, and everybody has the right to hear about it, be inspired, and, and, and go do something themselves as well. Mm. God, this has been so inspiring. Okay, so what I'm going to leave you with is this might be a wild card, might throw a little wrench in things a little, but I, one of the things that I enjoy most is I like to have my talking points together, as Susan said, but I am incredibly willing to throw them to the wind if need be. If there's a, I, I actually love it when something strange happened, something unexpected, something that I didn't know was, was coming. And so that I can be at the edge of my seat. And my, my, my prayer, my mantra is self-empty, Godful. So I want to go on a magic carpet ride with each interview I do. I want, to, I want to have it be exhilarating. I want something. I don't want it to be canned. I want to, if there's certain information that needs to come in that's, that's route, that, that wrote, and that's predictable, then that's great. But I always want there to be some kind of magic, some kind of authentic connection that, that happens no matter what. And that, that does happen when I think you open your mouth and allow something else to come through that's higher for a, for a purpose that, that really matters. And at the same time, keeping in mind that it's so simple what we're doing. It's always just people talking to people, whether there's one person listening or 10,000 people listening or a million people listening. It's just people having a conversation. So really it's not rocket science. It's what we do all day long. It's what we do so naturally. So just be yourself, have fun and be connected to what you're passionate about. And it's, and know that it's a privilege to get a chance to be interviewed ever by anybody. And Oh, my last word is just say yes. Whoever wants to interview you say yes. Even if you don't know who they are, you're not sure where they come from. It's, you never know where it's going to lead. You never know who's going to hear what you have to say and always be willing to flow. So I think this has been a great first session. So we look forward to one question. Yes, Benjamin. One question real fast. For people that do not have a Whole Foods and live outside of the country, what would be the soothing tea, like another, what would be the herbs that you would recommend for others? And that could be answered maybe next time, but I was curious just because, you know, not everybody has the, you know, those those types of teas. I would say for me, yeah, chamomile or peppermint. And I would say like sometimes just hot water with lemon and maybe a little honey is good. Um, anything that's warm or hot is going gonna, is gonna to relax the vocal cords and it's going to make the mouth feel good. So I think if you don't have anything except for hot water, then, then you're good. If you have some chamomile, that's good too. Yep. And peppermint, Thanks. it not only energizes, yeah. it relaxes, and it's brain focus. Woo! Yeah! Peppermint. All right. So let's end this call the way we end all of our calls with pointing at yourself and saying, I'm the change. I'm the change. Pointing at everyone else saying, you're the change. You're, you're the, the change. change. Pointing at all of us, we're the change. We're the we're change. The change. We're the change. So go forth we're and the be change. the change. Be the change. Mwah. See you next week. Thank you. Thank you so much. Ciao. Bye. Ciao.